Uh, I'm, I've got the honor today to introduce our next keynote speaker, uh, Natalie Denmead. All right. Uh, she's a freelance e-learning and gamification consultant. I always wanted to know more about gamification. So this is the time for me to actually pay a bit more attention as such. Uh, Natalie began working with web technologies over 20 years ago and went on to become a teacher and an educational transformation uh, uh, through a thought leader, sorry. Uh, she has developed significant visibility as a disruptive, I like this word, edupreneur, all right? Over the last few years, she has developed and managed blended learning programs in 20 African countries and founded the NGO in Tanzania. Natalie has uh, published a practitioner research on gamification and mobile first design in peer reviewed uh, journals and authored the top selling book, Gamification with Moodle. One of her earlier publications, the Moodle for Motivation Tool Guide poster has been distributed globally and translated into seven languages. Natalie participates in many global communities of practice in Moodle, gamification, and open education resources. Really uh, uh, a glorious, I would say, uh, what he called a resume in terms of our keynote speaker. Her keynote address uh, is the hero's learning, harnessing the power of play in learning design. Natalie, over to you for this keynote presentation. Thank you very much. It's uh, lovely to have that introduction. I'll just add that I am an Australian who has two homes, one in Australia, but right now I'm very happy to say that I'm sitting in Timbo Hotel in Stonetown, Zanzibar. I've returned to my home here uh, on the east coast of uh, Nguja. We have a project called Kuza Cave Culture Centre and it's very nice to be back home again after being away for a while. So I'll share my screen and begin the presentation. Give me one moment. So today's presentation is about the hero's learning journey, which I also like the title of that fun is another word for learning, which is taken from one of my gurus that I'll give you a lot of quotes throughout this presentation of people who've inspired me. And after this, if you would like to have a copy of these notes, you will have a lot of references of who you could follow to also get to the point that I have of understanding gamification. So I define gamification as, well, in the context of education, gamification harnesses the natural power of play and games to reframe learning goals to be more achieving and appealing. And the misconception is that I create games. That's not actually what I do. I hope you'll find out through this presentation the difference between those two fields. As an overview, I'm going to cover three areas. In the first section, we'll explore terms and concepts. In the second, I would like to motivate you as educators and academics to continue exploring this topic of play and learning. And in the third one, I'll provide some demonstrations and more specific instructions on how you could start applying this with a series of templates or frameworks that you may find useful. So the first thing I'd like you to think about is your understanding of terms that we use in everyday language. And we actually mean different things in different sentences or different people may mean different things. So I'd like to think about how you use these words. So I invite you now to join me by using the chat session, which I hope you have access to. I'd like you to write in the chat a sentence. When was the last time you said the word play? What context did you use the word play? And even if you don't have access to the chat or not writing, I'm sure you just thought of something in your mind. And what we usually get when we do this exercise is that people use it in extremely different contexts. I'll see what somebody wrote in the chat. So um, Benson, thank you for sharing. So you use the word play in the context of your child playing. That's probably the most uh, 
most common use of the word play. Playing a video, that's a really interesting one because a video is not a game or a tool, but we use the word play when we're talking about starting a video. And a playground for rich people, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a very unique definition of the word play, but I like that one. So in an education context, Irene is saying that using a Jamboard, the word play was used. And I think the, comp the perspective that you're offering there is experimental try something that's a little bit outside of your comfort zone and don't aim for perfection, but play around with it. So I'll just try to adjust my slides. Apparently I'm not doing this correctly. Okay, so if we were face to face, I would also get you to do another activity right now, but we can just imagine this. If you were sitting next to somebody, you could play this game. What do you call this game? Have, have you seen this game before? Whoops. I call it uh, tic-tac-toe. XO, noughts and crosses. If I was going to stop my presentation that you've all taken a lot of your precious time away from your normal life to listen to me, if I wasted 10 minutes, would you feel frustrated that I was doing that? Or would you trust me that I had a reason to do it? Do you find this game very frustrating? So I'm using this game as a symbol that this game can be very boring and repetitive if you already know the secret. And I think most of us here know that there's a pattern in this game. After a certain amount of turns, you realize that you know how to win. And I would say that the actual game is to find a new victim who doesn't know. So we go to our children and we do it with them. And when they eventually figure out what the pattern is, then the cycle continues. So this is an example of that is used by Raf Costa in his book, Theory of Fun. So this is the first book I'm going to recommend. It's actually quite short. A lot of game designers have used this as their Bible. So although I don't make games, I steal ideas from game designers and the game design world who have been sharing online for many years. And he explains that tic-tac-toe or knots and crosses, games are systems built to help us learn patterns. And he describes fun as that reward when you actually solve a very challenging puzzle. If you think about what's going on in your brain, that point of finding the pattern. And as educators, we can relate to this. We know that we want our students to get to the point where they realize, aha, that's the pattern. That's why this and this and this leads to a conclusion. So there's a lot of similarities going on here. On the right-hand side of the screen is a matrix of what actually is a game? There's four different categories there. Going on a roller coaster or physical sports types things and mastering your physical reactions, which doesn't really have a lot to do with uh, what we do in education. But the other three, I've, I've thought deeply about this. And I think the one on the bottom right is the one that has made me really change my practices as a teacher. I do believe this is the one that we most underutilize as educators. And I'll explain more about this one. He describes it as exploiting the brain software bug around probability estimation. The easiest way to explain this is gambling. When your brain doesn't know the outcome, when there's a risk and there's a chance, there's something about our human brains that just makes us bite in and stay on that journey until we try to figure out the probability around it. So the word risk and chance would be the education equivalence of that. So Raf Costa says that fun is another word for learning. I say gamification is another word for learning. 
And this explains better this idea of fun, uh, that we do have points of boredom and points of challenge, but we want to get to those peaks where we feel that we have achieved something. And in learning design, we can follow the same flow of game designers in creating a series of mini peaks that build up to a final peak. The game design world has a lot more money than us. They have teams of researchers and their sole mission in life is to entertain. We are at the other end of the spectrum where our sole mission in life is to educate. So somewhere in between, we can meet each other and share our ideas. This is a game designer called Jason Vandenberg who has a lot to say about motivation and learning. He knew that when he played games and enjoyed them, that that only represented a certain portion of his audience. So he went ahead and tried to understand why people liked different types of games. He came up with this matrix that there are four different types of games and people sit on different spectrums and they will like particular groups or types of games. Do you see any of your favorite games in this matrix? If you are familiar with any of them, you'll know that some of them are simulations with a lot of flexibility. Some of them have competition. Some of them are more fantasy. There's a whole range of games. And I did really enjoy reading his work. He then mapped what he was seeing to one of the most known frameworks of motivation called the Ocean Big Five Personality Traits. And I'll break down that a little bit more as I continue. What we're looking for is some evidence behind what we're seeing happening to, to guide us. So another paper that I'll recommend is this one by Olson from 2014. If you really want to understand motivation, perhaps you, you should ask twins. And he, this study asked 13,000 twins from six different countries. So some of these twins had the same genetic background and some didn't. So you, now you've got a really good comparison group. If a child comes home and says, I really didn't like my maths lesson today, was it because of the teacher? Was it because of the home? Was it because of the child? What actually makes the difference? And the conclusion of this study was that it actually is individual motivation it's not just whether it's a good attitude or you come from a good home or you have a good school. So we really need to create diversity in the way that we prepare our lessons to respect this. I'm getting a message that my internet is slow and I do have a backup network. So perhaps you can let me know if you're having trouble, but I think it's connected again now. So that was a very quick overview of what gamification is and the leaders in this field. I'd like to move on now to the next question. Does, is this of any use to us? I realize in this audience that there's a lot of higher education people and it's quite different talking about a primary school context or vocational context. So I'm wondering how can we use elements from games and game thinking in real life, does it really help us? I believe it does. And I'd like to show you some evidence of how, when I tried this, it really did help me as a teacher and a learning designer. So at the back of my head, I've always got this mantra that I'm reframing a real life task to be more appealing and more achievable. So there's two parts. So again, I'd like to invite you to chat with me. I'm sure you have tried to reframe a real life goal to be more appealing and more achievable. Perhaps I'll ask you as parents, what have you done as a parent or perhaps a trainer or a teacher to try to motivate somebody? It is controversial to say that our goal is behaviour change and perhaps in higher education that's not really so applicable but 
quite often training and education in a corporate environment is about changing somebody's behavior and it's a big job in a small time frame so we have to find ways to motivate people and nobody can think of an example perhaps you'll think of one later I'll give you some examples now of what we did in our classroom. It's a few years ago, but I like to use it as an example because it's, I was working with teenagers and they give very honest feedback. So it's great to uh, keep on changing. And we designed this together. With my own children, I was fascinated at what did motivate them. And one of the, aside from Minecraft, which we've all seen children get very involved in, the one that surprised me was loom bands. Many years ago, there was this fad, I believe it was worldwide. And it's, it's not even a digital thing. They were actually offline making these bracelets and necklaces. And if you haven't uh, looked into it, it's quite interesting to see how, how this went viral. And in the bottom right corner, you can see that this person who created the rainbow loom multicolor tremble single bracelet got nearly 12 million views on youtube so it's very motivating for this person to put a video up and be seen by their peers so there's a there's a cycle happening here where you may in a digital forum even though it's a non-digital activity and then you learn how to make more bracelets then you put it onto youtube you get more views so if you're with me now, you can see that there's a whole cycle of motivation taking place here. Sugata Mitri calls that a self-organized learning environment. So I started thinking, how can I integrate that into my own classroom? So when I went back for the next term with some very disengaged young people who lived in a rural area and didn't believe that there was much future for them because of lack of employment and all and many other issues as well, we decided to use some of these techniques. We called it the Velvet Throne Project, very much inspired by Game of Thrones. We broke people up into houses, which is nothing new. Schools have been using houses for a very long time. But we also used guilds, which were more mapped to the units and modules that I was teaching. And I did have a lot of very talented young people. So I would appoint the, the best one as a master or a mentor and delegate to them that they were in charge of their guild. I was very inspired by Mr. Matera who recently has started his own business with another teacher. So I'd certainly encourage you to follow him and he has very specific examples of how you can use this in your classrooms. There is a website uh, there with a bit.ly link if you'd like to see the students made a website to publish what we've done. So they did what I just showed you in Loom Bands. They created this Google's blog and added content. One of the most effective uses that um, we found was badges. So we had regular presentation ceremonies where the students were in charge of issuing badges based on criteria that happened to meet my, my assessment criteria. So I realized I was handing my work over to my students, but then double checking it, of course. But it was so much more motivating than when I would assess my students directly and get a lot of resistance and a lot of, I don't understand what you want me to do. But when their peers did it, it was a totally different experience. I would not have been able to achieve what I did without the use of technology. I had a computer room with a data projector and I used a learning management system, Moodle, that I was very familiar with to upload work ahead of time. So instead of me repeating the tasks that needed to be done, it was available on the website. And I would literally point to the projector and say, click here, and these are the tasks. And then I could go off and coach and support individuals rather than doing the monologue lecture that we uh, often have to do when we don't have technology available. The middle learning management system gave me these instant reports where I can see how far along each student is in the series of tasks and I can identify who's falling behind. Sometimes I would display this on the screen so that they could see what other people were doing. In game design, you get very frequent rapid feedback on your progression 
And in our education settings, we often leave our feedback to summative right at the end when there's no chance for people to catch up or rectify what they're doing. So the use of Moodle gives me that opportunity to provide much more rapid feedback. There are many, many reports in Moodle where you can drill down to each activity over what period and find out what people are doing. I experimented a lot with using group settings because the, the tribal approach and the group was so motivating. And I found that Moodle did have a lot of options for me to use this submission in groups. And I ended up writing a book about it because I, it was quite complicated. So there's step-by-step -step instructions on how to work through this. And it's ended up being quite a popular book because even if you're not using Moodle, a lot of the principles still apply. But if you are using Moodle, you'll appreciate the very detailed instructions. So what I ended up creating was a grade book that had grouped by each week and then each of the groups within the classroom. And I could see the group average and this would indicate the winner. However, as soon as we set this up, all of the groups pointed to one group and said, they're the A team, they're going to win, we don't want to play. And they were quite serious gamers and they had a point, they could see how this would work. So we straight away discussed it and said, well, let's just wipe the slate clean every week. So every Friday there'll be a winning team and come Monday, it starts all over again. And that actually gave the A-team a little bit of stress because we made sure that it was like a horse race where it was neck and neck. Everybody had a chance of winning. So we had to keep on tweaking the scoring system, what was rewarded to make sure that everybody felt like they, they could possibly win next week. I'm really glad I had them to guide me through this because I'm not really into the games anywhere near as much as them, but they knew how to, how to achieve that. So I would say work with your students on these scoring systems to make them work. One of the features of Moodle is that you get a tick when you've completed an activity to specified criteria. And I'd really encourage all of you to explore the, the value of this. It, it sounds really simple just to get a tick, but there's, it, um, when we're talking about motivation, if you have a list of things and you get a tick, 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 it really does give you a sense of accomplishment. I do a lot of interviews to find out what is going on. And in the end, I went, I did this class for three or four years. The completion rates were around 10%, which was heartbreaking. Why do people sign up for a course in digital media and then walk out the door silently? And I never got to find out what the issue was. So when I could get completion rates up to nearly 80%, I was simply astounded at the difference between me as a teacher who's passionate and committed and, high and trained to once I used these gamification techniques, we created a vibe. When you walked in the classroom, you just could not walk out. So I asked them, what, what should I do again next year? And you can see on the screen, I won't read it all out. They said they liked the freedom, that they liked the diversity, they liked the motivation, encouragement, and they liked playing. Most of the students in my class were young boys, but a quarter of them were older students. And it was quite challenging to have uh, mothers who were returning to work after 20 or 30 years out of the workforce mixed in with this younger group. And I, I occasionally get some, um, some negative feedback from these older students, but they, they came on board and a lot of them began mothering these young boys and really getting them to do their work. So it did, it was a little uh, confronting for some people, but we did get past that. I also asked the other teachers who worked with this same group of students. I thought maybe the vibe only happens in our class for our units, which was half the time. What happens in their photography class or their other classes that they're doing? And I really loved this piece of feedback. What this teacher said is that our class had resilience, autonomy and happiness. And 
he said that they were noisy and I do often get that feedback as a teacher that my classrooms are very noisy. But they do settle down and get back to work eventually. So that was really good to know that the uh, what was happening in one classroom did actually affect their learning style in other classes as well. On the negative side, the achievers, which I'm going to go into some rather deep theory in the next few slides, the high achievers were the squeaky wheels that really complained about the lack of structure and the lack of traditional learning. And I I had support from my managers that I could continue with what I was doing. And what I really found is that the more open explorers really appreciated what we we're doing and they didn't complain so much. So there was, it was really important for us to get forms and surveys out there to find out what everybody was thinking rather than just a knee-jerk reaction to a complaint that would then uh, be discouraging to the others. We played Zondel games, if any of you have ever uh, found them, they're a bit like Kahoot. And I found them quite controversial, particularly with the older students. Uh, they, they were really uncomfortable when you had to bet on your answer that I, I think it was digital audio. And it was a simple tool and in getting into this gambling risk where we said, well, that's what you answered, but how sure are you that you're right and you're going to lose your points if you don't get it and they were really quite upset it got quite tense and it was interesting that the younger students coped fine with that but uh, some of the mature age students asked me why I was doing it but we got through it and they uh, so I didn't play those on games very often in class because it was hard so now I have another question for you what is your favorite movie and who is the main character in that movie. I'm going to say that The Hobbit is one of my favourite books and movies. And I'm going to take you on a journey to show you how Bilbo went through a, tran a transformation and how I use that now to guide the transformation that the learners go on. Uh, a way of thinking about this is uh, <clears throat> a paper by Court from MIT where he says that what we're missing in education is the function of drama, that we're sitting at this lower end of data and Q&A and we're not getting up to the wisdom and the story and the whole level of transformation. So a way of thinking about what's going on at different points in this journey when you start and when you finish is the PSI theory of emotion that talks about each person having fuel tanks. There's six or seven fuel tanks in the theory, but I'm just going to talk about the three of them that are not at the base level of affiliation, certainty, and competence. So this idea says that you need to fill up your tank with competence and it will slowly drip out. So you need to keep on refilling it. This middle one, certainty, risk, chance, is the one that I'd encourage you to think more about. Affiliation is quite easy for us to understand. Some of us need more social connection than others. Some of us need more risk than others. Some of us are more open to opportunities than others. Some of us let things drop out very quickly and need our tanks refilled frequently. One of the gurus in game design is called Richard Bartle, and he talks about these types of explorer, achiever, socializer, and killer. And this paper that I'm recommending here mapped those PSI theory fuel tanks with the player types. So you can see here that the explorer type is the healthiest, most optimal type of learner. The killer or the socially dominant one is really lacking in all areas. So this is what I've got in my mind when I'm designing an e-learning course. How do I take the students on a journey so that they end up being more like the explorers than the other types? 
This is a very dense slide that is uh, a summary of an academic paper I wrote. It's available on my website, or you could possibly Google it to find it, where I started mapping all of these big five ocean types against these other frameworks and seeing how that helped me understand my students. So you can imagine if all of these people walked into my classroom at the beginning of term one, I'll use some characters that you might know from Game of Thrones. There's all different types of students. You get your poets, your priests, your warriors, your leaders. And in the middle, you can see that I describe them as friendly, supportive, organized, dedicated, curious, creative. They are all so very different. And you don't know on the first day. I would say that my favorite student would be Jon Snow. He's a bit of everything. We've all got our favorite types of students who we relate to better than others. And if you look at the outer areas here, I'm showing that if you go to the worst extreme of this, you'll get some students who are very shallow that try to please. You'll get some students that sit on the insanity end of the spectrum. Some students are very dominant and disruptive. We can set up activities so that we can transform them into a healthier version of themselves while respecting their personality traits. So I'm going to go through some templates and frameworks now of how you can apply all of this knowledge to courses. This is the Moodle for Motivation Guide. It's a little too small to read, but this grid here will show you all of those four types of achievers, socializers, and how each Moodle tool can be used. And you'll see that some Moodle tools like the discussion forum and the quiz are actually quite common across the different types. This is a design canvas just on a one page. You can really map out what are you trying to achieve? What game elements could you possibly use? How are you going to measure whether it was successful? So if you're starting a new e-learning project, there's a lot of cues there on how you could fill out that sheet. And this is the book that I mentioned that explains how to use different Moodle activities. And this one I'll probably say is the simplest way of explaining everything that I've just said, that you take people on a journey from being a novice through to being a problem solver. This is the pass point with their masters. Some of our students will excel and become experts or visionaries, and we'd like them to connect back with the other students in the class. And those four rows just show different ways that I think about, have I given you a chance to collaborate and share at each point in that journey? What can I create as a learning activity or an assessment at each point in that matrix? If I get it right, then I'm gonna take you on an adventure. You're going to pass that threshold where you resist learning you're going to be motivated to stay. There's going to be mentors and helpers aside from me as the teacher. There's going to be challenges and temptations. You're going to go to that point where you actually internalize, unlearn what you used to believe. And then you're going to take what you now know. It's going to transform you. And then you're going to go back to the real world with this new skill set or this new attitude or these new values that the learning adventure. So that's what I call the hero's learning journey. Different way of saying it is that at the beginning, our students are not aware that they lack a skill. We help them become aware. We create a need. We work through until it becomes a habit, and then they no longer have to think about it. What we are dealing with is extrinsic and intrinsic, both motivations and rewards. And because we have a global audience here, and these days I am working very global audiences, it is rather hard to know what is the culture of the local community? What is an intrinsic motivational reward in the group that you're working in? And that's the challenge is to find that and then build game-like interactions on top of what will motivate your particular group. So I'm getting to the end of wrapping up and then we can have some questions. I'd like to ask you, 
as a teacher, what sort of checklist could you put in for yourself? For me, I say, did I offer a diverse choice of activities and assessments outside of my own preferences? Do I know when to change my teaching style as people go through this journey? There's times to direct people, there's times to observe. We often have a uh, tension between whether we should be very instructional or supportive. And my idea is that at different points in the journey, we need to change our teaching style. Am I creating a, mind, a growth mindset, building learner resilience so that they keep on looking for that point of motivation? And am I avoiding the downside of gamification where I use shame and public failure through point systems that really don't achieve what we're trying to? And for the students, are your students finding patterns? Are they learning? It won't be fun if they're not looking for patterns, if they're not finding something in there that's challenging. Are we making the most of spiraling up from the basics of data and knowledge up through to wisdom and story? As teachers, we have knowledge, we have experience. There's a power differential there. And for me, the biggest value of everything I did was that we explored the possibilities of changing that power differential in the classroom and empowered the students. And I really believe that's where most of the improvement came from and the outcomes I saw. And finally, one of my main gurus that I did a MOOC on gamification many years ago, I'll leave the final quote to him. In a good game, the points and the leaderboards aren't what really matter. The true reward is the journey. So please enjoy all these references. I'm sure the PowerPoint will be available on the site somewhere. And if you haven't started a journey of gamification yourself, please be inspired by game designers. They have a lot to offer us as educators.